Greetings and salutations. Welcome back to Colin's Last Stand. My name is Colin Moriarty. Thank you for being here with me today. You'll surely notice that there is a major difference between the way this episode looks and the way the previous episode looked about the Third Amendment. There's a reason for that. First of all, the scripted stuff that I want to do, like with the Third Amendment and other historical, pretty much typically historical stuff, is going to be shot in a very specific way off of a teleprompter and all of that kind of stuff. The political stuff generally that I want to do, not always, but generally, is going to be more off the cuff and maybe a little bit more YouTube-esque in the sense that I'm going to uh, be doing some more jump cuts and the production value is going to be lower and all that kind of stuff. Um, I'm kind of glad that we have these two kinds of video formats because I will be able to synthesize uh, what you guys think about you know the positives and the negatives of both styles and maybe we can find some sort of fusion that pleases the most amount of people. Um, first things first, uh, I'm using my own camera for the very first time basically um, and my own lens, uh, microphone and all that kind of stuff. I don't know if the shot looks good or bad. The lighting surely doesn't look very good. There's shadows on my face and whatnot. Um, I don't have my glasses on because the glare from all the light in this room is, is reflecting off of it. I'm learning as I go, so I really do appreciate your patience. If it makes you feel any better, the little microphone on top of my GH4 camera that I bought, uh, I tried to get that to work for a half an hour until I realized, oh, there's no fucking battery in it. So also uh, I got this thing and I was going to record the the sound separately just in case because I know the sound isn't great in here the microphone that I have is really good but um, the uh, the dampening in here is pretty bad um, but I put the card in to this thing here and then it tells me that the format's all wrong and there's an error and yes I know I look tired I know I am I'm so goddamn tired but also the bags under my eyes aren't being covered by my glasses so so today's episode of Colin's Last Stand is going to be a pretty meaty episode, I think, and it's about the political compass test, which you guys have probably heard of. Um, and I know that a lot of you guys like to say compass. It's compass, at least in my head. So if you go to politicalcompass.org, you're going to find this test, and this test has been up for like 15 years. Some people have problems with it. I'll put some issues that people have in the, in the uh, description if you guys want to read some reasons why maybe you don't like or don't trust the test, but I like it. I think it's pretty accurate. And actually, the results it gives me on the political spectrum are identical with a much deeper test, uh, which maybe I'll do a video on in the near future. But this is a test that's a great thing to take if you want to see how you feel and where you stand. And uh, you'll see me looking in this direction here because I'm using a computer. What I'm basically going to do is I'm going to do the test with you. And we're gonna, I'm going to answer the questions. We're going to do it together. Uh, you have multiple options here. What you can either do is take the test yourself, like maybe have me on a phone and then take it yourself and then we can talk things through. You could just watch the video and, and take it later or you can just not watch the video at all. But then I don't understand why you even got this far. But what I'm going to do is I'm going to describe why I answered each way. Each way. Some of the answers you're not going to like. Uh, some of the answers I'm sure you will. And uh, it will give a little bit of a description of what's going on in my mind and why I came to these conclusions. And I suspect that none of us will ever have have the same answers across all of the questions. So uh, let's be patient with each other and accept each other's different political um, moorings, as it were, and get to work. The first question is a tough one. It says, if economic globalization is inevitable, it should primarily serve humanity rather than the interests of transnational corporations. I don't really know how this question works unless the answer is disagree. I don't think you have to strongly disagree by any stretch of the imagination, but global, globalized markets exist for corporations and for consumers. So this question is really asking more of an economic question in my, in my mind. And I do think that humanity needs to be served through the products, but corporations can't exist just for the benefit of humanity itself or the corporations do not exist anymore. So I don't think the answer is an easy one, but my answer is disagree. The second question is I'd always support my country, whether it was right or wrong. Here, I'm going to disagree as well. Um, I'm not going to strongly disagree, but <clears throat> I am not always going to support the decisions my country makes. They're, they're disa uh, disastrous sort of decisions that have been made in the past of this country that I don't agree with. There have been things that I felt strongly about at one time that I also don't agree with anymore, such as the Iraq war, which I supported uh, well into 2005, 2006, until I really saw the error of my ways. I made a mistake. Um, and I think that there are things that the country has done in the past, obviously in the deep past, that are that are reprehensible and, and no one can stand by those things, including uh, slavery. So my take on this is simply that you can't always support your country, whether it's right or wrong. Part of supporting your country is acknowledging when it's wrong. The next question is, no one chooses his or her country of birth, so it's foolish to be proud of it. My personal uh, answer to this is 
I strongly disagree. It is true that no one, none of us, have the sentience, the ability uh, to be able to pick where we're born and who, to, who we're born to and, and, the, and the conditions that we are raised up in. And indeed, on Rubin Report, anarcho-capitalist Brian Kaplan was talking about how where people are born is the biggest detriment or advantage to how well they do in life. I mean, I think that's obvious and I think he's right. But nonetheless, I don't think it's foolish to be proud of where you come from and proud of who you are. I am a proud American. I am a proud New Yorker. I'm a proud Long Islander. Those are things that I'll always carry with me. And so I strongly disagree with the notion that it's foolish to be proud of the country in which you are born. Of course I am. I'm a patriot. The next question says, our race has many superior qualities compared with other races. I strongly disagree with that. Uh, I do not believe in, in eugenics or racial science in any way. I think that um, there's nothing better about me as a white man with Italian and Irish heritage than there is uh, from a black woman or an Asian woman or an Indian man, etc. and so on. We are all humans and we need to be judged based on the content of our character and our merit and not our skin color and our race and all of those kinds of things that a lot of people like to obsess over and that I think is personally destructive in 21st century polity. The enemy of my enemy is my friend. To me, this is kind of a fact. And so I'm gonna actually click here, agree. I agree with that. I don't really see how you can see it any other way, not only contemporaneously, but also in history. Think about it this way. In the American Revolution, we wouldn't have won without the help of France, which we, we, we sent Jefferson and Adams and Benjamin Franklin and everyone over to kind of get their help. Without their help in 1777, 78, all the way through Yorktown in 1781, we would not have won. We weren't really friends with France. In fact, people like John Adams completely distrusted their intention in getting into the war. But because the French and the British were mortal enemies, the enemy of our enemy was our friend. And we've seen this over and over again. Of course, World War II is probably the most famous example of this, where the enemies of the Nazis were our friends including the Soviet Union, who then became our enemies once the Nazis were vanquished. So this is just a fact of life. I'm not going to strongly agree with that, but I do agree with the general notion that the enemy of my enemy is my friend. Military action that defies international law is sometimes justified. This is a tough one. And if I could stay neutral on this, I would, because there are certainly cases that a person can bring up and say, hey, isn't this an example of military action that defied international law that was still justified? And I can say, yes, of course. Um, so whether I agree or disagree here, I'm going to vacillate on that. I think I'm going to say agree. And the reason that I'm going to say that is simply because you could put a hundred different scenarios in front of me and 99 of them would defy international law and not be justified. But surely you could find an example where international law was infringed upon because we had to act in a specific way. That's not necessarily bad, but it's against international law. So I'm really just hedging my bets here. And so I think you can really go with agree or disagree, but I do think there's a lot of gray area with this question. The final question on the first page says, there is now a worrying fusion of information and entertainment. I strongly agree with this. I don't think that there is a problem with fusing information and entertainment. We see that on Fox News, we see that on MSNBC and CNN, we see that all over the internet. Hell, you might even see that right here on Collins Last Stand, depending on your interpretation of the situation. But without having just information, without having just facts, and then blurring over into partisanship or entertainment, that's a problem. People watch Rachel Maddow, not because they wanna hear necessarily what she thinks, because a lot of people already know what she thinks, but because it's entertaining to hear her go off on the other side, for instance. And I think that that can be very destructive. I don't know who to trust anymore. I'm finding that a lot myself with the Trump-Russia connection. I'm finding that with the, the election, even with Hillary Clinton, who's telling the truth, who's lying, who has an agenda, everyone has an agenda. I think that this fusion has really muddied the waters and I hope we can kind of reel it back in. But in the meantime, I strongly agree with that sentiment. All right, so moving on to the next page. The first question, these are all economics-based questions, by the way. It says, people are ultimately divided more by class than by nationality. This is a tough one. Um, and I think that you have to agree with it. I mean, at least I do. The difference between, say, being British and being American is very minimal. The difference between being a rich person in America and a poor person in Britain is way more dramatic. And so <clears throat> you can be poor in the United States, and that means that you're actually very well off compared to most of the world. Um, and that is not a nationality issue. That's a class issue to me. So I agree with the idea that people are ultimately divided more by class than by nationality. Nationalities, religion, race, 
uh, ethnicity, all those things, depending on where you are in the world and what you're talking about, also divide people. Obviously, look at the Middle East, where Israel is divided from the rest of the Middle East, or look at what's going on in Syria and Libya with ISIS and all these different terrorist organizations kind of infiltrating different countries and creating maybe really governments of their own. These are nationality divisions, and, um, and these are divisions that don't have to do with class. The next question is, controlling inflation is more important than controlling unemployment. And I agree completely with this statement. In fact, I strongly agree with it. The reason that I strongly agree with this notion of controlling inflation is simply because this goes back to the value of the dollar you already have, the money in the bank. Unemployment can and should be controlled in its own way, but controlling inflation is super important. Inflation is the reason things cost so much and the reason that things cost more and more as we go uh, on in time. So inflation needs to be controlled because that's about the money you already have, that's about your savings. If you're working and then you suffer from hyperinflation a couple of years later, like what would happen in the Weimar Republic in the 1920s, well, that's a huge problem, right? You might as well not have worked at all, in fact. Inflation should be controlled and kept down. It makes the dollar you have in your pocket or the pound or the euro or whatever worth more over time. It's important. The next question is, because corporations cannot be trusted to voluntarily protect the environment, they require regulation. I'm a pretty hands-off kind of guy, but I generally agree with this. And here's why I'm t clicking agree as opposed to disagree. I don't strongly agree one way or the other, by the way. I agree simply because I think that there has to be some sort of regulation on a, on a, on a factory, for instance, saying, hey, uh, you can make your goods. You don't have to pay a carbon tax, any of that kind of stuff. Just don't dump your sludge in the river, okay? That's a regulation. And I understand that that kind of stuff still happens. But those kinds of very laissez-faire regulations that are kind of reasonable – I think are totally acceptable, and so I agree with that statement. The next one says, from each according to his ability to each according to his need is a fundamentally good idea. Communism is fucking stupid, so my answer is a vehement, strongly disagree. There's not one example of a successful communist nation in the entire history of the world. The biggest one, of course, was the Soviet Union, which collapsed under its own weight. There's really only one purely communist country left in the world, that's North Korea. The other communist countries that still exist, like China, uh, are really market economies now, so they're not communist. And of course, from each according to his ability to each according to his need is really one of the fundamentals of Marxism. And you guys can go read more about that if you want. The next question says, it's a sad reflection on our society that something as basic as drinking water is now a bottled branded consumer product. For me, I disagree with this. I don't think it really says anything about society that people want bottled clean water. What's the big deal? We live in a, on, a, on a planet with, what, 7 billion people. Not everyone has access to clean running water. Not everyone has access to a ready amount of water, even. Going and buying a bottle of water is, is not a shameful act. It basically means you just want to drink water. And there's companies that serve that, that function. If people didn't want it, they wouldn't exist. Land shouldn't be a commodity to be bought and sold. I obviously strongly disagree with this. I don't know that I really have anything else to say about it. Land is a commodity that is bought and sold all over the world. That's basically one of the major foundations of the capitalist society. Not having a commodity to be bought and sold basically brings us, what, to collectivism or to feudalism? I was just reading about the, the time leading up to the Russian Revolution in the 19-teens, and even the time leading up to the first Russian Revolution in 1905, and how it wasn't until really the middle of the 19th century that Russia, a very backwards country at the time, uh, even abolished feudalism. People couldn't sell their land. They were stuck to the land. They had no ownership of the land. Does that sound fun to you? Because that's really the other direction if it's not a commodity that can be bought and sold. That's the direction we go in. That doesn't sound positive to me. It is regrettable, says the next question, that many personal fortunes are made by people who simply manipulate money and contribute nothing to their society. I, I disagree with this. I don't strongly disagree with it. Part of the economy is uh, using money to make more money. You spend money to make money. I know that's a trite thing, but that's the truth. And if there are people that literally exist in the world of finance, what's the shame in that? The world of finance and baking is part of the fuel that makes the engine go. So I'm not really one of the people that wants to sit here and shit on that personally. Protectionism is sometimes necessary in trade, is the next question. I strongly agree. I am a protectionist. And I've talked about this in the past. I understand why people don't like protectionism and why they are vehemently for free trade. And I am for free domestic trade. But when it comes to international trade, the, it's basically this. We can have free trade. We can have fewer jobs and cheaper goods. Or we can have protectionism. We can have more expensive goods, but more people are employed. And I'd rather have the latter if possible. I don't think that it's all protectionism or all free trade either. I think that we have to make these, these arguments and these, these deals 
and these situations on a country by country and maybe even business by business or industry by industry basis. For instance, if there's a reason why we want to have a free trade agreement with Great Britain because their economy is on par with us and they pay their people a living wage, then that's fine. But if we're dealing with a country like China, who's paying their people a very a small fraction of what we pay our people to make, say, steel, and then they ship that over and compete with American steel, that's not fair. That's not fair to the steel workers. And that's not that free trade brings everyone down, including everyone in our own society. It basically settles at the lowest common denominator. Ultimately, I'd rather raise that tide, have the Chinese steel tariffed so that it costs more and makes uh, the steel workers in, say, pe Western Pennsylvania make more money, have a living wage, and get that American steel out into the wild. It's not fair that we can't compete. The only way that protectionism wouldn't be necessary is if everyone in the world was under the same socioeconomic circumstances, but they're not. And that's why protectionism, to me, makes sense. The only social responsibility of a company should be to deliver a profit to its shareholders. This is a tough one. I'm going to veer towards agreement. I don't think that uh, a company has a responsibility to anyone but its shareholders, and the responsibility of the shareholders is fiduciary to acquire money. That's the idea. I'm not saying companies can't do other things. They can't have green initiatives. They can't do good things in their communities, all that kind of stuff. But that's not what this question asks. It says, the only social responsibility of a company should be to deliver a profit to its shareholders. And I fundamentally agree with that. The rich are too highly taxed. I agree with that. I don't strongly agree with that because I think the rich should pay their taxes, but I do agree with that. I think we're all too highly taxed. I believe if we have to keep the income tax in a flat tax, that's way lower than the tax rates now. And ideally, I would get rid of the income tax completely and replace it with a VAT, a value added tax on consumables that are not essential. So no taxes on food or shelter or clothing or fuel. But if you go buy that yacht, maybe you pay 25% on top of that. But that's not really an extreme tax considering under that situation, you wouldn't be paying income tax. Those with the ability to pay should have access to higher standards of medical care. I agree with this because what it's basically asking me is, should a person with money be able to go to a private hospital and get a private doctor or a private surgeon? Of course. So yeah, I strongly agree with that. I think it's a pretty straightforward question. It's not asking me anything about universal health care. It's basically saying, if you have more money, should you be able to pay for a higher access of health care? Of course. If I have a million dollars and I want to go find the best doctor in the world to give me a physical, that's my right. Governments should penalize businesses that mislead the public. I agree. In fact, I strongly agree. I'm going to say strongly agree. The government has certain functions within the realm of the economy and within the realm of uh, controlling and regulating business. And I think that this is one of them. If a business misleads you, if it, if it puts up an illegal commercial, for instance, that tells you things that are a lie, that, that sh they should be held to account for that. A, a business should be able to be unfettered on a free domestic market and should be able to sell its wares and its goods. But it shouldn't be allowed to just lie to you or sell you shitty things or tell you you're getting something that you're not. There's nothing wrong with the government stepping in and regulating that. That's a protection of your liberty. The next question is, a genuine free market requires restrictions on the ability of predator multinationals to create monopolies. This is a tough question because it's not really, a it's asking you like a fundamental fact. It's not really asking you how you feel about it, even though it is implied. Because what it's at, a genuine free market requires restrictions on the ability of predator multinationals to create monopolies. And that isn't what a genuine free market is, so I disagree. A genuine free market would say that there were no rules at all. So how would there be restrictions on the ability of predator multinationals to create monopolies? I would disagree with that. I don't say I don't think that's right, but my answer to that is disagree. The freer the market, the freer the people is the final question on this page. And it's a tough one. I think I'm going to disagree. I don't know that your freedom is necessarily contingent on your ability to buy things. Your freedom is contingent on the liberties enshrined in your constitution, uh, your inalienable rights, whether you feel like you're, they're endowed from God or a creator. That's what makes you free. A free market, I guess, can play into that. But as I made the case uh, with the protectionist question, there are ways that a free market can limit or hurt you too. So the next page is all about social values. These questions are all about social values. The first question is abortion, when the woman's life is not threatened, should always be illegal. I strongly disagree. I don't think uh, abortion should be legal always and under any circumstance. I think that there has to be a firm cutoff date unless someone is at the, in danger, the mother, for instance, uh, is in danger. But I think after three months, maybe, maybe a little more, abortion should be completely illegal. Before then, I think that uh, a woman should be able to make a choice that's best for her and for her life and for her family and for her sanity. There's no shame in that. There's no doubt that that clump of cells grows into a baby. No one disputes that. But is it reasonable to expect that a 16-year-old girl that gets pregnant by her boyfriend on accident 
now has to have a child and ruin her life? That's not your choice to make. The next question is, all authority should be questioned. And I strongly agree with that. Authority should be questioned at every level of the government, always and forever. Authority should be questioned. It is healthy and important. An eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth. Hammurabi uh, is what they're asking you basically here. Yes, an eye for an eye and tooth for a tooth. I agree with that. I don't strongly agree with it, but I do agree with it. I think there's nothing wrong with the premise itself, but I do not want to also always take it to the utmost conclusion either. I mean, I fundamentally believe in an eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth in regards to the death penalty. I believe that if you brutally murder someone and you're not, it's not in self-defense or it's not an accident, you should be put to death. That's an eye for an eye. The next question is, taxpayers should not be expected to prop up any theaters or museums that cannot survive on a commercial basis. I agree with this in premise, uh, simply because it says taxpayers should not be expected. It should No, taxpayers under any circumstance should not be expected to go and say, oh, the museum or the theater is failing and therefore we should pay for it. That doesn't mean that there isn't a place for taxpayers to pay for museums and for theaters. But that's not what the question asks. It says should not be expected. No, you should not be expected. It should be additive. The next question is schools should not make classroom attendance compulsory. I don't know. I think that if it's a public school and it's being and taxpayer money is being used and it's being propped up at the federal, state, or local level, or probably a combination of all three, I kind of disagree with that. I mean, that's a waste of the taxpayer money. Why would these kids have to go to school? If it's a private institution, if it's homeschooling, I don't know that you necessarily have to send your kid to school. I think that's probably stupid if you don't. But I don't see why attendance shouldn't be compulsory uh, for going to school. And that's not to say that you can't miss a day for being sick or your, your dad can't pull you out of class to go to a game or something like that. I, I, that's not what I'm talking about. What I'm saying is if you're in a public school and the taxpayer is propping you up, then you probably should have to go. I don't think that there's anything really wrong with that. The next question says, all people have their rights, but it is better for all of us that different sorts of people should keep to their own kind. I disagree with this notion. Um, surely there are groups of people that probably shouldn't be together, right? I don't know that you want to drop... Um, Jewish people from Israel in the middle of Mecca, for instance. I don't know that you want to have Sunni and Shiite Muslims living together, for instance. But I don't think that it should be protocol that different kinds of people uh, should should be separated. Uh, and it's better for all of us that different sorts of people are, are, are kept to their own kind. I think that that's inherently racist and bigoted. Um, so I disagree with that notion. The next question says, good parents sometimes have to spank their children. I agree with that. I don't have kids, and I don't even know that I would necessarily want to hit them either if they were doing something bad, but who am I to tell a parent that's a good parent raising good children that there isn't sometimes a need to spank that child? I don't think children should be beaten. I don't think children should be punched in the face. I don't think children should be knocked around. But if little Billy, you know, calls grandma a whore, for instance, a little smack on the butt, not a bad thing. The next question says, it's natural for children to keep some secrets from their parents. Strongly agree. Don't even really understand what the question is other than that, but obviously that's the case. Every kid has secrets from their parents, always. The next question says, possessing marijuana for personal use should not be a criminal offense. Strongly agree. I am a longtime marijuana smoker, uh, and I think I turned out okay. And I did it in states and at times when it was really illegal. When I was in college in Boston, it was super illegal to smoke weed there. That, of course, didn't stop me, and I was stoned for a solid five years in a row. The prime function of schooling should be to equip the future generation to find jobs. Agree. Now, this goes to who's paying for the school and at what level of schooling we're talking about. School should also function as a way to teach kids how to be well-rounded, how to read and write, how to appreciate music and fine art, all those kinds of things, history, geography, etc. But really, at the end of the day, it says the prime function of schooling should be to equip the future generation to find jobs. Of course, when you go to college, that's what it's all about. You go to college for electrical engineering because you want to be an electrical engineer. You go to college for pharmaceutical sciences because you want to be a pharmacist. Pretty obvious. I agree with that. People with serious inheritable disabilities should not be allowed to reproduce is the next question. I strongly disagree with that. The state cannot have that level of control over the individual and it is not up to them on if those people reproduce. So if a person has something that they can pass on to someone, I can't even think of a disease right now that's, that's necessarily genetic or inherent. That's really their liberty to do that. And I don't think the state can exert that much uh, control over a person either. 
The next question says, the most important thing for children to learn is to accept discipline. Strongly disagree. That's not what the most important thing for a child to learn is. The most important thing for a child to learn is to respect people, to respect authority, surely, but also to learn and to play and to grow and to uh, examine the world around him or her and to figure it out. That's what's most important. The furthest thing or one of the furthest things from important that a child needs to learn in the whole uh, tiering system of things a child can learn is to accept discipline. The next question is, there are no savage or civilized peoples. There are only different cultures. I disagree with this. And I'm going to explain to you why I disagree with this. There are definitely savage and civilized people in history. Absolutely. And sometimes it doesn't work the way you think it's going to work. It was a pretty savage thing what the Spanish conquistadors did to the Central and South American uh, native tribes. That was a pretty savage thing, wasn't it? Um, likewise, what the Nazis did, the Nazi culture, and the hate that they propagated was also savage. So there are people that are civilized and there are people that are savage. And I would say that the Nazis, for instance, in recent history, were not civilized people. And I would say that even though on the out, uh, you know, for, if you're looking at like the Aztec empire as something that was savage, well, no, I would disagree. I would say that they're actually in many ways quite civilized for their time and place. Perhaps it was the bloodletting of the Spanish that was uncivilized and savage. Just some food for thought. Those who are able to work, the next question says, and refuse the opportunity should not expect society support. I strongly agree. If you are able to work and you refuse the ability to work and then go to the government for help, I have no sympathy for you. Help like that should be uh, kept for the disabled and for people that are truly down and out and have no money and no ability to fend for themselves. If you have the ability to fend for yourself and you refuse to, it literally says those who are able to work and refuse the opportunity, no sympathy for me. And so I strongly agree with the statement that they should not expect society support. I never really understood the point of this question, but here it is. When you are troubled, it's better not to think about it, but to keep busy with more cheerful things. I disagree. That's just the way I work. I don't really have much uh, of anything deeper to say than that. I don't think running away from your problems is a smart thing. I also don't think ruminating and obsessing over your problems is a smart thing either, which is why I don't strongly disagree. But I do disagree that it's, that it's not, it, it, is it necessarily more productive to keep busy with more cheerful things, as it says, when you have, uh, when you're troubled? I don't agree with that. The next question is, first generation immigrants can never be fully integrated with their new country. I disagree with that. I think I think a lot of it depends on the age in which a person came over, the country of origin, the society and like the little community that that person might grow up in. For instance, if a, a first generation immigrant can be a five-year-old uh, from China who barely speaks Cantonese and grows up in the United States and by the time he's 18 is indistinguishable from a person who grew up here those first five years in addition to the ages six through 18. So I disagree with that notion. I think that it's less likely that first generation immigrants are fully uh, integrated in their new country. And I do have concerns that uh, a lot of uh, people coming over these days to the United States and to Europe and to Canada and elsewhere don't seem to be as focused on integration as uh, previous generations. The next question is, what's good for the most successful corporations is always, ultimately, good for all of us. I disagree. I don't know how you can possibly agree with that statement. Uh, what's good for successful corporations is money. Them making money is not necessarily going to be good for all of us. It might be good for their shareholders or the people that work there, but not for all of us. For instance, what if a company like ExxonMobil, very profitable, very rich company, is making money with fossil fuels that are polluting the air for everybody else? That's great for them. It's also great for us in the short term, but is it good for us in the long term? Eh, remains to be seen. The final question here is, no broadcasting institution, however independent its content, should receive public funding. I disagree with that. While I believe in small government and an unintrusive government, I also don't think that there's no place for us to fund the arts and the humanities and learning and education and all those kinds of things, especially because the amount of money spent on something like PBS, for instance, is minute. It's, it, it practically doesn't even exist. That's how little money it is. So I don't think that there's no place for that. But certainly there are better places to spend money. The next set of questions ask how we see the wider society. The first question is, our civil liberties are being excessively curbed in the name of counterterrorism. I strongly agree with this statement. This is what I was talking about at length on the Joe Rogan experience. And to me, I feel like I'd rather live in a more unsafe and unpredictable society that is freer and more contingent on protecting liberties than to give those liberties and rights away for some modicum 
or some uh, of 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 uh, protection or some notion of protection or some promise of this nebulous idea of protection. Our rights are being excessively curbed because of because of uh, terrorist attacks. And so I strongly agree with the statement. Our civil liberties are being excessively curbed in the name of counterterrorism. Absolutely, I agree with that. Next question says, a significant advantage of a one-party state is that it avoids all the arguments that delay progress in a democratic political system. I strongly disagree with that statement. It's true that the United States, when it was founded, was a one-party uh, state, but that quickly dissolved, uh, mostly because the founders were very naive about the about the forming of political coalitions. And obviously, that was going to happen. They had already seen it happen in places like Great Britain. What this uh, basically insinuates is that a one-party state, like Nazi Germany, like uh, Juche North Korea, like communist China, communist Cuba, the Soviet Union, do those sound like nice places to live? That's what a one-party state is, and uh, they don't do anything right. So I strongly disagree with the statement. The next question says, although the electronic age makes official surveillance easier, only wrongdoers need to be worried. I strongly disagree with this as well. It shouldn't be a matter of what you're doing. You should have the right to be protected from something like NSA mass spying and the collection of data. Um, this argument goes back to the Patriot Act in, in, in the post-9-11 world, in which they argued, well, if you have nothing to hide, then what are you worried about? It's a bad excuse, and you don't want to go down that road. You do not want to use that excuse. It opens you up to all sorts of injurious things. Do not go down that road. The death penalty should be an option for the most serious crimes is the next question, and I strongly agree with that. I am a strong proponent of the death penalty, especially for people that murdered uh, one or more people, and that that murder wasn't manslaughter, and it wasn't an accident, and it wasn't in self-defense. Um, and can be conclusively proven. Um, I also believe that the death penalty probably should be used for crimes that are not murder, but that a person was really hurt and injured over. For instance, you really want a, a, a man who raped, violently raped and, and destroyed the lives of three women to just you know live in prison for the rest of their lives? I don't. I think that that person should probably be executed. How about a person who uh, for years was hurting children in his neighborhood and, and molesting them and, and, and fucking them up? Should that person be allowed to just go to prison for a few years and then get out? Not in my world. The next question says, in a civilized society, one must always have people above to be obeyed and bo people below to be commanded. I disagree with this simply because of the way the question is stated. Obviously, in a capitalist or free society, there are people above you to obey, I guess, and there are people below to be commanded, I guess. But I don't know that that's the only way to have a civilized society. We have not reached the utopian ideal. We may never reach that ideal. I don't think that's going to happen. But I think it would be somewhat arrogant of me and, and assume that I have knowledge that I don't to say, yes, of course, that's the case. I don't agree with that. The next question says, abstract art that doesn't represent anything shouldn't be considered art at all. I strongly disagree with that. I see some of these pieces of modern art and abstract art and they're just garbage, just like a red square or like a, a, a ball of clay or something. I don't see it as art, but I don't feel like I should be able to project that on someone else. Someone can look at anything. They can look at this SD card case and say, oh, look at this beautiful piece of art. I don't think it's art, but who am I to say that it's not? So I, I just don't think that we should really uh, be dictating what people consider art and what they don't. It's the same argument back in the video game industry. Are video games art or not? Of course they're art. But if a person doesn't look at video games as art, I know that um, Roger Ebert, the, the esteemed Roger, Roger Ebert, didn't look at uh, those things as art, then who am I to say that he's wrong? He's a person with his own opinion. In criminal justice, punishment should be more important than rehabilitation. I agree with this statement, but there's a caveat. I think that a lot of people in the prison system in the United States, probably maybe even half of them, shouldn't be there at all. Uh, for minor drug offenses, uh, for drug addiction and all those kinds of things, people should be expelled from jail and prisons uh, for those particular problems. But when we're talking about people who assault people, who rape people, who murder people, um, who rob people, who, who uh, betray people in some financial way, whatever it might be, I'm not super worried about them being rehabilitated, and I actually question whether a lot of them could ever be rehabilitated. What I'm more concerned about is them doing their time. So I agree with the statement. The next question is similar. It says, it is a waste of time to try to rehabilitate some criminals. I agree. In fact, I strongly agree. I'm going to say strongly agree. There are some criminals that aren't worth rehabilitating, and there are many criminals that cannot be rehabilitated. If a guy is doing 30 or 40 years for a uh, for secondary murder, for instance, we're worried about rehabilitating him? To what end and why? Is the person that he killed that's six feet under getting rehabilitated too? The next question says, 
the business person and the manufacturer are more important than the writer and the artist. I strongly disagree. I understand the nature of the question. What they're basically saying is the people who create things that are bought and sold and commodi- and, and made into commodities are more important than the people that think and uh, think abstractly and write and philosophize and do all those kinds of things. Um, I just think that all of them play a role in modern society. And so I disagree with the notion that a business person or a manufacturer are better or more important than a writer or the artist. Everyone plays their role, even in the freest market, even in the most libertarian society. The next question says, mothers may have careers, but their first duty is to be homemakers. I strongly disagree with this as well. A woman should have every right and the agency to decide their own path. And I think this goes both ways. I think there's a lot of judgment on women that decide to be homemakers or decide that they want to leave the workforce and raise a family. I think that's a noble thing. I think that's an important thing. It's an essential and vital thing for our society. But a woman should never be coerced into doing something like that if they don't want to. They should have every right to exceed uh, expectations. They should have every right to achieve goals. And uh, anyone standing in the way of that, uh, that's inherent sexism. The next question says, Multinational companies are unethically exploiting the plant genetic resources of developing countries. Today, I don't know if that's necessarily happening. I'm going to disagree with this. The final question here says, making peace with the establishment is an important aspect of maturity. Uh, I strongly disagree with that. In fact, I strongly disagree with the fact that you should ever have to make peace with the establishment at all. You can accept that they're there, that the the establishment exists, but the establishment is a part of a lot of our problems too. And we should never make peace with them. And we should never make peace with that, no matter who's in power. All right, page five here is about propositions on religion. There are only five questions. It says, astrology accurately explains many things. I strongly disagree. Astrology is not science. Astrology cannot be proven. Astrology is silly. Um, I just don't agree with that at all. It says, you cannot be moral without being religious. I strongly disagree with that as well. I do not think morality is based on religion. I am an atheist. I also have a great deal of respect for people of faith. I come from a pretty Catholic family. My dad specifically is a devout Catholic. But I don't think that you can be moral only if you are a religious person. And I don't think living a moral and just and right life is tied to your religious virtue. I just don't think that's true. I think I live a very good, virtuous, moral life as an atheist. And in fact, I would put my morality up against any Christians any day of the week. The next question says, charity is better than social security as a means of helping the genuinely disadvantaged. This is an argument that's tough. I'm going to say agree uh, because I think that when you're getting it from charity, the person that's getting the help might not feel as guilty as they do or made to feel as guilty as they do if they're getting it from the government in which the taxpayers around them have funded this thing as opposed to maybe some anonymous person that gave money to a church, which is then given to a person who can't feed their family, et cetera, and so on. I don't necessarily think there's anything wrong with the government handing money and help out when it's needed in very limited circumstances and cases. But I don't think that that's necessarily better than the private industry or private charity doing that. I just think that that's the ideal. And before Social Security and the New Deal and before uh, the Great Society and Medicare, charity was doing those functions in the United States. The next question says, some people are naturally unlucky. I strongly disagree with this. I don't believe in luck as this innate thing. I don't believe in luck as something that can be measured. I think that typically if you measure a person's luck and and, and lack of luck, it probably evens out somewhere in the middle, just like a coin flip. The final question here says, it is important that my child's school instills religious values. I strongly disagree with that. No public school should be instilling uh, religious values of any kind into a person. We are a secular society based on Judeo-Christian tradition in some sense, sure. I have no problem with in God we trust on money and in public buildings and I have no problem uh, putting your hand on a Bible in a, in a courtroom and I have no problem saying, uh, or presidents after the oath saying, so help me God in the tradition of George Washington. I have no problems with that. I think atheists and secularists make a lot of hay over this for no reason. But I don't think at the end of the day, I should be sending my child to the local school and, and that child coming back with Christian values taught to them. That's not the school's job. Okay, the final six questions are all about sex. It says, sex outside of marriage is usually immoral. I strongly disagree with that. Pretty much all of us have sex outside of marriage. And uh, I think it's actually somewhat important to sexually uh, explore before marriage. Uh, sow your wild oats, oats as it were. Um, and see how you feel about certain things. I don't think there's anything wrong with that. Sex isn't tied to morality. 
The next question says, a same-sex couple in a stable, loving relationship should not be excluded from the possibility of child adoption. I strongly agree with that. I I think it's perfectly fine for a gay man to marry a gay man, a gay woman to marry a gay woman, and they should be given the same rights as uh, straight married couples, in this case, to adopt a child. I don't believe for one second that a child raised by two men is necessarily going to be any worse off than a child raised uh, by a mom and a dad. And I think that a child raised by two dads is probably going to be way better off than a child raised by maybe just a mom. The next question says, pornography depicting consenting adults should be legal for the adult population. Of course, I strongly agree with this. And I would go a step further and say that uh, I would legalize prostitution for everyone 18 years and older. I don't see how it's the government's job or uh, problem who you're having sex with as long as everyone's consenting and of age and legal. Um, how you're getting off and to what you're getting off in the privacy of your home or in your bedroom or your bathroom or wherever you are, um, as long as everything's on the up and up and, and legal. The government needs to get out of these things. And I'm not so sure that we're super far away from prostitution being legalized too. Uh, it's the world's oldest profession and uh, I think that there's money to be made there both by individuals and by the government. Speaking of which, the next question says, what goes on in a private bedroom between consenting adults is no business of the state. Strongly agree with that. Can't agree with that more. And this goes back to the pluralization of adults, consenting adults. Uh, I believe even in the uh, legalization of polygamy. I don't see why the government should stop a man from marrying five women if all five women and that man are all consenting with each other, being in that relationship with each other. They shouldn't get extra benefits or anything like that from the government. But who is it? Who's the government to say that a person can't explore their sexuality or their relationships in the way that they want to as long as everyone is uh, consenting and everyone it's, it's all legal? The next question says, no one can feel naturally homosexual. I strongly disagree with this. I know plenty of gay people. One of my best friends growing up was gay. These things don't just, these are not choices. I don't know how anyone can possibly feel that way. Um, these people are born gay and they are gay and they should be accepted as being gay. There's nothing wrong with that. And the final question says, these days, openness about sex has gone too far. I gotta be honest with you, I kind of agree on this. And I'm gonna agree with it, I'm gonna tell you why. I feel like society itself has become overly sexualized and that children are getting younger and younger and becoming more and more in tune to that um, to that reality. And I don't think it's healthy for children to be um, necessarily wrapped up in all of that and thinking about things before it's time and all of that stuff. So that's all I mean by that. I think an openness about sex, about sex education, about safe, uh, having safe sex, being responsible, all of that's very important for teenagers, for instance, to learn about. But I don't think an eight-year-old or a nine-year-old needs to be worrying about that. And I don't think an eight or a nine-year-old needs to be walking around and necessarily being, uh, being exposed to some of the things they're being exposed to in, in, in wider media. I just think it's irresponsible. But that's just my take. All right, so those are all the questions. And as you can see here, I'll put it on the screen for you. I'm a little bit over to the right and a little bit more down on the libertarian angle, uh, but pretty moderate in a lot of different ways. I'm curious what you guys are as well out there. So uh, go ahead and let me know in the comments where you stand. Um, I hope you found this fun and interesting. I think this is a great place, as I said at the outset, for us to begin this political awakening and to figure out how we all feel. Because now that we know where we are on the spectrum, uh, the political spectrum, we can now kind of move towards uh, each other and try to find some common ground and some solutions and, uh, you know, grab the hammer and the nails and, and some boards and start to really fix this problem that we find ourselves in. All right, so that's it for Colin's Last Stand. I hope you had a good time. I enjoyed it. Uh, let me know what you thought. Uh, be good to each other in the comments. No bibliography this week because there's nothing cited, of course. But be good to each other in the comments and keep on learning.